Today I'm going to show you what's inside the BMW Tri-Tech engine and how it works. Now the Tri-Tech engines are a four-cylinder engine developed between BMW and Chrysler back in the day. They were mostly used in the Mini Coopers. This one's out of a 2005 with 260,000 kilometers on it. Now taking a quick look around this engine, this would be facing the firewall at the exhaust side here. We do have a plastic valve cover, an aluminum head, an iron block, as well as an aluminum oil pan at the bottom here. The oil filter is externally located at the back of the engine here. Now looking around the front here, you can see you've got our throttle body which would lead to a plastic intake plenum we've got a port injection fuel rail over here there's no direct injection on this one and we've got the ignition coils that will sit directly on top of the spark plug finally around the front of the engine you can see the cooling system over here with the water pump directly driven off of the crank pulley and behind all that is a timing chain now, apparently this engine had a burnt valve and was causing low compression in one of these cylinders so we're going to tear it down just to see why it failed all right, first thing we're going to do is remove the fuel line here next we're going to remove the intake plenum a bunch of 10 mils and we can pop off that plenum. Oh, these are so brittle. All right, next we're gonna knock off this valve cover. It's a bunch of eight millimeter bolts. There we go. Oh, someone's put RTV inside of the valve cover for some reason. Taking a look under the head cover here, you can see we've got a single overhead camshaft. It's gonna power the rocker arms. There's two intake and two exhaust valves per cylinder. All right, next up, I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold this rocker arm set up on. Get the big guns on there. Okay, at least with the Honda, you get everything all together. With this one, is everything separated. Now we'll get the exhaust side off. So those bolts also hold down the camshaft, so I can actually pull off these cam bearings over here. I don't see any wear inside of them. They still have very clean oil on them. The crank bolt is only a 15 millimeter. I wonder if I can crank it off. I need to stop the engine from turning somehow. There we go. Now the water pump is driven off of the crank pulley over here, and it's got the coolant inlets over here, and the crossover tube down at the bottom here. I'm going to start by removing the coolant inlet here. And I'm going to remove these 13s. Should be able to knock this off. All right, this one's going to probably need a puller. Finally, now I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around the timing cover. Now this is a BMW, so they have some random torques on here as well. If they're using Torx as a security fastener to make sure you don't take off the timing cover. There's only one cam position sensor on this because there's no variable valve timing. Let me see if I can get that cam bolt up. Let's see if we can get it with the breaker bar. Now the timing cover is down below, but this head here doesn't really have a timing cover. So in order to access two bolts behind here, I gotta remove this hex. It's a 10 mil. And then there's two 10 millimeters inside of here. Pop the lower timing cover off here. Oh, it's got an integrated oil pump. You can see the inlet and the outlet there. So here we've got the timing chain set up. You can see it's very simple and straightforward. Just two guides with a camshaft and the crankshaft here. There's no other belts or gears inside of here to drive accessories. And we've got the timing chain tensioner over here. You can kind of see the influence from BMW with this design, not having the timing cover come all the way over to the head here. So in essence, you kind of have to lift this gear set off through the top of the head here. Once I loosen up all these things here. I'm going to loosen off this 19 millimeter timing chain tensioner here. So I take out that bolt. The tensioner itself comes out the back over here. And now I've got lots more room. So I can take that chain off. Now that the chain's off, I can actually lift this up and over here, over the head. Now I can take this chain tensioner off here. You can see it's lined with plastic. There's not much wear on it. And this one over here. Again, this engine doesn't look too wore down, but it had 260k on it. Now for a mid-2000 BMW, I'm actually surprised that the setup is so simple. Now let's take off that camshaft. And you can see there is a bit of wear on this cam bearing over here. It's actually quite a bit of a groove there. I can feel it with my wife's toothbrush. And there's a lot of wear marks over here on the cam bearings. Now these part of the cam bearings are actually integrated as part of the head casting. Looking down inside of the head here, you can see there's two 13 millimeter bolts. These are head bolts, but they don't hold compression. Now I'm going to remove the head bolts. These are 15 millimeter regular hex bolts, which is interesting that they're not some fancy Torx or E-Torx, given this is a BMW. Hey, and they're not even on there pretty tight. All right, now we're going to gun these off. All right, let's see if we can take this head off. All right, I could see that this engine had a lot of carbon inside here. Maybe it was burning some oil. While we're sideways here, it's an interesting placement for the oil filter to be facing the firewall in the engine. Now you can see the oil filter housing, oil pressure switch, as well as this gasket over here. Next, I'm going to flip this engine upside down. Oh shoot, there's coolant coming out. Not as much mess as I expected. Being a small car, I do like how they're using an aluminum oil pan. I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around. I'll we'll just pop that off. 
Actually, it looks pretty clean in there. I think they had good oil in this. Now, this engine was running properly. There is nothing really stuck in this oil pickup tube over here. You can see that would lead down to the front of the oil pump, which is part of the timing cover. I'm going to go ahead and remove this. Turn down here. And then we can pop off that pickup tube. Here you can see there's no cradle or anything supporting the bottom end. It's just a steel block itself. You've got these steel main caps that run along over here with extra bolts on the outside as well as the inside. And then of course your two small connecting rod bolts. They're actually just 10 millimeter bolts. They're so tiny. Luckily these aren't some fancy e-torques or something. It's just a regular 10 mil. Let's take a look at those rod bearings. Wow, they look pretty clean. Let's get piston one and four. And these connecting rod bearings are also clean as well. Now I'm going to remove these tens that go along the main cap bolts over here on the outside of the block. Peel off this gasket here. And the main cap bolts are just a 13 mil. Alright, now I can take off this lower oil pan, which is actually part of this ladder frame design. I didn't realize. I thought it was actually part of the block, but that's a pretty strong unit. Now I'm going to remove the crankshaft. Now I'm going to remove the pistons. So you've got all the components laid out here. Let's take a closer look at how it works. So starting at the bottom here, you can see you've got this cast iron ladder frame design here. That makes the bottom end of this engine very strong, especially if you want to add like a supercharger to get a little bit more power out of it. Many other vehicles use a ladder frame design just within, but this is actually part of the upper oil pan design. So looking at the lubrication system, it would begin at the oil pan down here, where oil is going to be sucked up through this pickup tube over here, and then come out to the oil pump at the front over here. Now the oil pump itself, sits on the front of the block and is actually part of the timing cover and rotates with the crankshaft. You can see the inlet and the outlet over here. It's going to create that fluid flow and then send it through this oil galley inside of the block. Let's take a quick look inside of this oil pump. And here you can see inside of the oil pump, I do notice that there's a lot of wear marks over here. That rubs up against this housing over here, which also has some wear marks. Essentially, this is going to draw in oil through here. It's going to fill this cavity, and then as this rotates with the crankshaft, it's going to squeeze that together to the outlet. The oil from the oil pump is then going to be sent over here to the oil filter housing. That's going to be filter it out and then send it down through here into this galley that runs along the length of the block. There's also a small branch of it that comes down to pick off oil to lubricate the head. Now underneath the block here, the crankshaft, is going to be lubricated through these holes that are drilled down to tap into the oil galley that runs along the length of the block. And here's what that oil filter housing looks like. It uses a cartridge style oil filter with a plastic cap that would screw on here. You can see you've got the inlet, outlet, and the exhaust that's going to drop waste oil back down into the sump. And at the back here we have the oil pressure switch. At the top of the block here you can see this is where the oil galley is going to come up and feed the head. I do notice there's a lot of carbon buildup in this head gasket area here. What I do like is Man, my wife's going. One thing I do like about these designs is that they're really sturdy. They've also got a semi-open block design here. We've got these little walls here that are going to support the cylinder, and that's going to create a nice strong block, especially if you want to put a lot of power down through these things. What I do notice though, there's a lot of carbon buildup along this head gasket area over here. So this engine was probably burning a lot of oil. As you can tell, leaking is also a common thing. That's just a common thing with all BMWs, to be honest. And what I don't like is that there's not a proper timing cover on here. Essentially, you have to slide the timing chain down over here makes it a little bit more difficult to time. Taking a look at the pistons here you can see we do have a nice thick connecting rod at the bottom here and very lightweight pistons at the top here. Now this engine is pretty worn out you can see along the sides here a lot of evidence of piston slap where it's worn against the cylinder wall of the engine. Here we have our compression rings at the top here which are nice and free but the oil control ring you can see is starting to gum up with a lot of carbon and that's probably causing this engine to burn a lot of oil. Check out all the carbon that's built up on top of the pistons here and the story is pretty much the same with all the other pistons. This engine was just being tired at 260,000 kilometers. Now taking a look at the engine head here you can see the issue is very similar. Look at how much carbon is built up in these little cavities over here along where the head gasket would be. And the head itself appears to be in good condition. More of the most common issues with these Mini Cooper engines is low compression which is what the previous owner of this engine complained about. Typically one of these valves would burn out and that would cause the compression that happens between the piston and the cylinder head to just push right through the exhaust port and send it out to the back. Now once you've completed your dry compression test the best 
best thing to do would be a leak down test where you would push compressed air down into here and you'd hear it squirting out the exhaust or the intake side and that's when you know that one of these valves are not sealing or they're bent or burnt or cracked or maybe even the piston has a crack. Now I don't see any glaring issues with the compression right now as the previous owner complained but low compression is a very common issue with all these mini engines. Speaking of low compression some of the other issues that could cause low compression besides busted valves is a bad timing system that's throwing off the timing of those valves. Of course a piston that either has a big crack in it doesn't exist or it has worn out piston rings or the cylinder wall itself has worn out so much that it's allowing that compression to escape back into the crankcase. In addition having a camshaft that's worn out won't allow these valves to completely open or seat properly and that's where you could have low compression. Now take a look at cylinder number four here you can definitely see some pitting here where the camshaft is starting to wear out and if we flip that over here to piston number one you can see that this camshaft is definitely starting to wear out. You can see a groove here where the roller kind of dug in and created that groove here and that's not going to allow your valve to seat and unseat properly when this camshaft is rolling around. Now in addition to the camshaft the roller rocker arm system that rides on top of it could also fail. You can see these things here have this little ball joint on it and that's going to ride up against these valve seats over here. Of course those could also wear out. In addition you could also have broken valve springs. Alright I'm going to remove some of these valves so we can have a look and see if they're bent. I'm just going to put my socket and whack it so we can get the valve keepers off. There we go. We have valve keepers flying all over the place. Now with all the valves loose I'm going to turn it over and then start popping these valves out. So here I've got all the valves laid out. You can see that these valves here are more or less straight. Those are the exhaust valves and intake valves from cylinder number one, two, three, and four. And here's where those valves came out of. Of course, if these seats here are not proper or even the valve stem seal is leaking really badly, then that can also cause compression to escape down into the head. Of course, the most obvious thing would be a blown head gasket and that would cause your compression to either mix with the oil system in the crankcase and you could open the oil cap and you feel a lot of puffing coming out through there indicating such a failure. Furthermore, if the compression system mixes with the coolant jacket that's around here that would cause it to burn a lot of coolant with white smoke coming out of the tailpipe. I'm kind of ruling this out in this case because this isn't really a Subaru after all. And that's a look inside of the Mini Tri-Tech engine. Now this engine was co-developed with Chrysler and I think that's why this engine is actually pretty simple and doesn't have too many design cues with the exception of not having a proper timing cover for access. Now while this engine is definitely solidly built and you could throw a lot more power at it, I think it's going to need a lot more maintenance and repairs than a typical subcompact cheap and cheerful vehicle. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.